Well, hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and q and I'm Dave McCormick from Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to present, as I am most Wednesdays, Dion McCormick, no relation, who is our lead solutions engineer here at Alpha. Today, Dion is going to be going over something which is pretty exciting, and that is the new release as of, I believe, yesterday, Alpha Anywhere, any Alpha Anywhere version 4.4. We also have Sarah Mitchell on the line, who's our documentation uh, expert, and uh, she will be here to help point us in the right direction when it comes to finding out information about these new features. So let's get started. Hello, Dan, are you there? Yes, sir. Excellent. Let me go ahead and make you the presenter. And I can see your screen. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for taking your time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, we are here for you. So the first part of this is I'm going to go over the new 4.4 release, touch on some uh, the, the key features that are coming out. We're going to have more deep dives on these uh, as we go forward, but we want to kind of let you know what's available and start uh, sort of sparking your creativity of how you can take this and really enhance your apps. Um, also, the later part, we're going to do a Q&A, so do take the time to go to your questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel and enter in those questions. And Dave will be monitoring that. And as we go through, we will try to answer them as much as possible. And remember, if you have a burning question, uh, you don't have to wait to log in. You can send it to guides, that's G-U-I-D-E-S, at alphasoftware.com. We monitor those. We, uh, we try to get all the information back. And we also use that for our webinars. So again, guides at alphasoftware.com and in the meantime put in your questions in our Q&A panel and uh, we'll be able to hopefully answer those questions as we go through it. But as Dave said, today's focus is on the new and improved release. You'll notice that the last release was 4.3.2. This one we decided there was so much in this one and so many key features really game changer type features uh, that we bumped it to 4.4 and is now available so you can download it and start playing with it immediately. So here are the new features that are available. First we have new reporting capabilities, new data integration capabilities, new mapping and geolocation capabilities, security enhancements, a bunch of new UX capabilities, some things involved phone gap, uh, some really nice performance things, which I've actually experienced is very cool, and a couple new development aspects that are really helpful for doing kind of team development. So as you can see, there's a broad set of categories that are available uh, that are included in this release. And I'm going to jump through each one of these. And this is more of a bold bullet pointed list. And then what we will be doing in very near future is going through some of these in much more detail uh, to show you the capabilities. And actually a couple we've already covered, they were in the pre-releases up to now. So let's get started. First on reporting is very powerful is the new integration with SQL Server reporting services. So this allows you to use existing SQL Server reporting services right within your apps. And there's multiple clients we have that are sort of Microsoft shops. They have MS SQL and they have MS SQL uh, reporting services. They've already generated a lot of very powerful reports. And now with this new capability, you can take Alpha and integrate it right into it and you don't have to recreate those reports or do a lot of work. And this is very powerful to leverage existing sort of capabilities within or within enterprises that you're working with. And the other is that SQL Server reporting service is enormously powerful. It is a very mature, very powerful product. So keep that in mind is that if you're working with someone with SQL Server and you may need some heavy duty reporting stuff that may make sense maybe there versus in Alpha's reporting, uh, you can tie into it. It gives you more choices as you go through and build your architecture architectures. So that's the new reporting capability there, SQL Server reporting services there. Now on data integration, there's a lot of new features and capabilities. And I'm going to pop through these fairly quickly. But first, we've always had a flying start genie. This uh, allows you to take, say, a access database and then turn it into an alpha web application with just a number of point and clicks. Uh, before, if there were master detail relationships, like so you had a table and a subtable with child relationships that had a foreign key relationship. Uh, before we just created separate grids, now very powerfully the Flying Start Genie will actually code those so it will actually bring in the top level tables and then make linked con connected grids 
for the child tables that are already set up. So for anybody who's converting from Access to Alpha, it's going to be a lot easier and a lot less manual work that's required. And that's now built into the tool, which is very exciting there. Another capability which I think is very exciting as we move more and more to increase the power of the list control is the ability to ex import Excel files. Uh, up to now, we've always had the ability to, we've had Action JavaScript that allowed you to import Excel files into grid components. And that's a great way to go because a lot of times, a lot of data is sitting down on an enterprise in Excel files and you can just import that right into a grid. Well, now you can perform that same capability, but instead of a grid, you can now use a list control. So you can have a list control on a, on a um, web page and then uh, have an action JavaScript that will open an Excel file and import that data right into the list control. Very, very cool. And also allows you to use the list control in ways you hadn't been using before. So as you can see, the list control continues to merge very quickly or uh, essentially uh, mutate very quickly to take on more and more of the capability of the grid control, which is a far more mature control. But also more importantly is that it allows you to do more and more with the list control and you don't necessarily have to use a uh, data grid. And the list control is powerful because it's fully responsive, it has a lot more capabilities in terms of clients of uh, data templating, and it works really well on mobile platforms. So very exciting stuff from there. Uh, another one um, which is very cool, and, and we're going to actually talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but there's some new action JavaScripts that allow you to get server-side data. So the idea is uh, more and more, especially when we're talking about disconnected applications, you want to have the ability to grab data from the back-end data source and bring it local onto the mobile device and have it available to be used. And you'll see one of our big features leverages this capabilities. Uh, and we've had the ability to do what are called data series, which allows you to connect back in data sources and then have that data available for other components. But up to now, it's really been more of a server side activity. And now we have these really cool server side data actions that allow you to grab data and bring it down onto the mobile device so you can work with that data disconnected. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We also have some really nice uh, server side store and retrieve data, uh, basically SQL import and create table SQL. These are enhanced X basic functions that allow you to do some nice uh, manipulations of SQL tables and SQL databases. Uh, allows you to do things like automatically create new tables, etc. So you can essentially make a system that's almost self-managing and self-creating. And along with that uh, is also some really nice JSON enhancements. We've always had the uh, JSON parse and JSON generate capabilities that would take, say, JSON, turn it into a pointer variable, move it back, etc. But now we have JSON shred which takes a piece of JSON and turns it into an array of objects, which is mainly how most, uh, a lot of the like charting and other things use that. But also we have a new one called CSV to JSON where you can take a CSV formatted and turn it into JSON. And again, this manipulation of JSON is very, very powerful. The world is going more and more to JSON in terms of a sort of a way to move data between systems, but also a way to make uh, you know systems more responsive. JSON is very efficient, very easy to read, very powerful. So what we're doing is continuing to mature the functionality of our XBasic language that allows you to manipulate, change, modify JSON very simply without having to write a lot of code. Thus, if you need to take CSV data and prepare it to be sent to something that is going to accept JSON, like a web API or something like that, you can do that very, very readily. Uh, and vice versa, if you have a piece of JSON and you need to convert it into something that is going to be a little useful with like a JavaScript library, you can do that. So with data integration, we've got new flying start genie. We can now import Excel files right into list controls. You're not limited to grids. We've got some nice server side actions to bring data into mobile uh, solutions and some really nice different functions for manipulating databases and handling JSON. So a lot of work went into this and a lot of this is really ground baking stuff for what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, actually, after this one is the charting aspect, which will go there. Now, also with mapping, as that continues to become such a killer part of mobile applications. In fact, I was on a demo this morning, and they were talking about a, you know, 
field service staff that has to go out in the field and when they're out in the field they need to have a set of save appointments for the day and they need to visualize that through a mapping capability well alpha is making that really really simple um, I'll talk about the second part first which is the new Google Maps action JavaScript one we've actually demonstrated a couple weeks ago which is the ability to add multiple markers to the map using client side data so this is really cool because you can have a list control grab the, say a list of appointments for a day for someone and then literally disconnect it and then boom uh, from your back-end server and then boom you can now uh, show those pins on the map using the list data instead of having to go back to the server so you can visualize what your daily appointments are also we can add KML layers or KML layers which is really nice uh, what KML is it's it's called Keo Mark keyhole markup language it's Google's markup language so if you want to put layers on top of a map and a good example of this is let's say you had a, a, a map of the United States and the company had say six territories and you basically had different areas of the map we well, can create a KML, KML layer that would then paint those different areas and nicely within alpha you could overlay onto your map that KML data. So you could bring up a map, show the territories, and then on top of that, put your individual pins. So KML is very powerful because there's a lot of really nice tools that allow you to create sort of layers on top of your Google Maps to present more data. So you could really create a layer that say maybe showed a whole bunch of fixed points on your, on your map and then overlay a dynamic data from there. And then also we can now get a pointer to a Google Map object which is powerful because once you have a map there's a whole suite of JavaScript commands that are available for you to manipulate that map. So you can create a Google Map, use our automated tools to kind of set it up and then if you need to do more extensive manipulations or interactions you can grab a pointer to that map on the mobile device or on the website and be able to handle that and then be able to manipulate it through JavaScript commands and that was just a really nice to have in terms of being able to do that now back to the first one what three words what is that there's actually a website you can go to it what three worlds words these guys this 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 company has created a very interesting technology they can take three words and convert that into a physical location on the world so right now if you think about it like if I were to say uh, my, uh, I want you to go to my local convenience store. Uh, I could give them an, a physical address. I could then geocode that into Latin lawn and a point and then be able to show it there. But it's kind of hard to say someone, uh, oh yeah, I remembered, go to uh, latitude 94.13334 and longitude negative 123.32124. Uh, you're just not going to memorize that. Well, this technology allows you to change that into uh, let's say three words alpha baker alpha baker gamma or uh, shelf penguin vase and they'll take those three words and encode those into a latin lawn and so it's much easier for you potentially depending on your capabilities unless you're rain man or something like that to remember three words instead of remembering you know 20 or 30 digits long of position so i can tell you hey go to uh, alpha the Kappa Gamma to get to my store or go to my little location. Now this is less kind of important in the states because there's so much resources available but now if you look at a position say in Africa or in a place out in the middle of nowhere you can um, now geocode even like something like in the middle of a field or something like that you can create a three letter or a three word uh, combination that gives you that exact location and you can put those three letter words in there and it will convert it into a Latin lawn and then convert it to a pin on a map showing you where it's at so it's really cool it's a lot of fun and it's very easy to use uh, play around with it I, I, yeah, I can't imagine what we can use with it but it's a really cool memory device and it's a fun little tool that can be do there so we have some cool new action JavaScript that allows you to enhance the capabilities of your map use it more offline and disconnect it from your back-end databases and also we have the new what three words which is a lot of fun from there okay security there's a really cool new security one. This one I've been waiting for personally for a long, long time. Uh, it uh, looks a little arcane, but it basically allows you to create a user with a username and password with a single command of context.security.administrative create user. So it really simplifies you. If you want to create users in your system, uh, this makes it, there used to take about four or five, six, eleven 
lines of code, now you have a single piece of code that will insert a new user into our security system, including encrypting their password, etc. So if you're doing kind of self-management of security, like let's say you have a registration page on your mobile app and you want to just create a user off that page, you can just use these very nice easy to use. And that's a um, that's a server side action, meaning you would do an Ajax callback and you would call this passing it the username and password. It would then set up the person in the security system and then you could take them to a login screen and go ahead and log in from there. Really cool and I'm really happy they put that in because life is good. And really important thing and I want to kind of take a moment here. You'll notice that the language says context.security.administrative create user. That context is very important. That is the new way we handle these kind of security uh, server side items. So for instance, instead of saying session dot, we can use the context object. And what's really powerful about this object, and you'll hear more as we go forward to it, is that um, it, if you're using IES with the alpha application server plugin, then it uses, it can handle all of the security elements of say a web farm. Uh, so really, uh, we're moving more and more where we handle things like session variables, uh, server-side variables, things like that using the context object. This is a good example of this. And what's really powerful is that if you use this, this methodology, the context object, then it's going to work great whether you're working on a single app server on alpha, if you're using a single app server on IS, or you have an IS server farm with 50 different servers it's going to then take care of figuring out where that data is. So uh, keep that in mind, but a really nice new feature there. Now, some really fun new UX controls are in place. Uh, first, with the form view, uh, you know, which is a very powerful uh, control, we have now what are called lookup fields, which allow you, for instance, let's say you had a field uh, that was, uh, let's say it's status, and status was open, closed, or pending. And, but the, underneath that status was, Stat, the, the code for each one was like one, two, three. Now in the form view, you can display those, those the visual, uh, you know, open, close, pending, but behind the scenes do the ID. So that's really, really helpful uh, from that standpoint. So before you would kind of set up a lookup field in your form view and it would just show whatever's in there, let's say one, two, three, but now you can define and say, okay, one, two, three actually means these other and then do that. So it makes it much easier to put together these kind of foreign key relationships where you have like a record and then you have these secondary tables with, with unique IDs that give you like the status and other pieces there. Also we have form view commit and this one's a little more subtle. Uh, right now you can do a form view commit but we have a new one allows you to say commit the form but only with a few set of uh, fields. So let's say you want to take more control over how the data is submitted uh, or committed into a list. So you have a list control and you have a form view. When you edit the data and you say form view commit, it would just push all the changes to that form view into the list. But now you could actually specify which fields uh, you would want to do that. And so it just gives you a finer level of granularity in terms of controlling over there. Now this is huge. This is super, super important. Client-side data series. And we're going to actually come back and do a whole session on this. This is the important aspect. We've always had something called a data series. And, uh, and in fact, I'm going to jump over here real quick just to talk about it. I'm going to create a UX control here. And for people who are new, I'm going into my development environment and creating a just a blank UX here. And we've always had the ability to define what are called data series. So I'll go to my properties and then I'll look down here. I'll go down here. We'll go to, I'll look it up, data series. Okay. So I have this thing called a data series and it's going to look kind of like a client side data cache, but I'm going to double click data series and I can create a data series and watch as I walk through this. So series one, and then I can edit that, and then I can populate that with SQL, DBF, static data, customer, JavaScript. So again, for people who are familiar with client-side uh, data caches, this is very similar. The idea is I can create this sort of a data object that knows where to get its information. And by the way, what's really cool, SQL cross-section is neat because it allows you to do kind of pivot table type translations of data from data in your backend database to how it used. But the important thing about it is that the data series would then, uh, once you've set it up, so for instance, if it's SQL, I'm going to tell it to connect to my backend database here. 
and then I'm going to, once I've done that, I'm going to tell it which table in the database, let's say it's my customers here, and I'm going to tell it, bring back, oh, I just need these four lines right here, and then I can filter, et cetera. And then I can actually preview that data, and it would bring back the information from the back-end data series. Now, this is really cool because now once I've got this data series, I can then use things like charting and other things like that to visualize that data in there. Now, the downside up to now before this release was data series was a server side item. So anytime it needed to refresh or anytime you needed to touch a data series, it would be calling and returning the data back from the database. That's great and works fine if you're connected to your server and online, but if you are offline, you don't have that privilege and that's not going to work because you need to be able to do it. So now what Alpha has done is they've extended the concept of a data series now. You set them up the same way, but now data series can be client side, meaning that I can set up these series like client side data cache and then it's going to automatically execute those and bring that data down to the local device and then that data available is available offline, which is really, really cool. And then I can use all the other features I wanted on that. Now, why is that important? Well, we're going to show you in a moment. One of the cool things about the client side data series is we can now connect that into our, uh, our charting. In fact, let me go ahead and just jump right over there and I'll come back there. We now have JavaScript chart controls and these JavaScript chart controls allow you to do JavaScript charts. These are newer modern looking charts and what's really cool is they work, the libraries are on the mobile device so they will work on the mobile device and they will work offline and last but not least is we can connect these to the data series that have been stored locally so now you can do full and complete data uh, offline charting without having to connect to a server or anything. Now you're not limited to a data series. You can actually create the charts and connect that chart to say a list control that you have locally. So it really extends the ability and these charts are beautiful. Uh, let me see, let me go here. Uh, sorry, let me jump in here real quick. Go right here, uh, da, downloads, uh, let's go here. Want to show you, I'm bringing up uh, our release notes. Uh, if you'll look in your chat area, uh, Sarah will be dropping in a link to the more detailed information about this. See, it's pretty extensive here. But let me bring this up here. Um, this charting is going to be so much fun. This is an example of a chart now, this semicircle. So you get this beautiful kind of KPI indicator there. But now we're going to have these beautiful charts. And as you can see, we have a whole bunch of them. We have bar charts, horizontal line pie radar sky and waterfall etc and these are all javascript they can be combined together so you can create very quick they're based on a open source library called rgraph so let's go ahead and uh, i'm going to go ahead and allow that and open it up rgraph is a third-party product and you can go on to it and you can see the examples of the kind of beautiful charts you'll be able to render and uh, you can take, and that we're using the SVG charts, which is very cool because SVG is incredibly fast, all the rendering is done by the web, and it works beautifully on mobile devices, and last but not least, they're scalable. So if your mobile device is horizontal, it's going to do a nice, beautiful horizontal chart. If it's vertical, it's going to squeeze it down, but look really, really nice. Uh, so you can see some examples in here if you go here. Uh, demos are here. Let's go into the demo here. And so you can go in and see these, uh, all the types of charts. So all these are available now. Now check that out. They're animated. They look gorgeous. Uh, let's see if I go like this. Hold on a second here. Um, oh, that one's not scaling, but you can scale them so you can resize them so they look beautiful. Uh, they can also be interactive, but all of this is handled for you, meaning that we take care of all the libraries we instituted and built into our development, we've actually got wizards to allow you to do this charting. So your charting is going to go from like, if you haven't been doing any charting, you're going to be able to do it very quickly. If you have been doing charting, your life is going to get a lot simpler because we're going to make sure all that. And that's a big, big, big feature. 
it's built on this new data series client side, the new chart libraries, and if nothing else, download and play with that. You're going to be able to create cool dashboards. You're going to add a lot of eye candy. And more importantly is for people out in the field, you can now provide these beautiful charts to increase their usage of the application. They can see, hey, what's going on? You know, where are my numbers at? Uh, like a person on a factory floor can see what their workload looks like or how they're doing from there. And so that, and again, uh, Sarah has pasted into uh, the, uh, the chat area. And so you should be able to click on there and you'll get the latest release notes from there. So that's the biggie there. And uh, let me go back to my there. Go ahead in there. So our JavaScript cart control. And as you can see, a wide range. There's some really good examples. Uh, there's some demos that uh, Selwyn has put together to show you how to build them. And you'll be able to integrate charts very, very quickly. And we're very excited and very pleased with this feature and think it's going to do a lot for us there. So that uh, involves a number of different things there. We also have some other new little JavaScript capabilities, uh, some new pre predefined styles. Uh, one thing I like to talk about on JavaScript is something called a5.runchain and what a5.runchain does is that JavaScript is inherently asynchronous so if you have like three JavaScript commands they're just going to run and they don't wait to finish well alpha is included now something called a5 run chain which is a method that allows you to sequentially run JavaScript commands so you can say run this JavaScript command wait till it's done and then do this one and this one versus having to worry about those pieces there. And, and we've had people who've been doing some sophisticated kind of multi JavaScript commands. So that's a really cool one called A5 Run Chain. Very neat. So big ones with UX is the new form view capabilities, the new client side data series, which enables our new offline JavaScript libraries. By the way, those libraries are not just for offline. You can put them in your dashboard. It's really fun there. And it's going to really, really be beautiful. And you're going to have a lot of fun. So go check out the release notes and our charts there. A couple other quick things, and I want to go ahead and wrap it up and open it up for Q&A. Um, there's a new template for using sound effects using the native sound generation capabilities of PhoneGap. And also, we now have a command line, CLI is command line interface. So right now, it's kind of a manual process to build and deploy. Alpha now is exposed to, and I mean, sorry, Cordova has been, has been sort of a command line interface, but now you can use that with Alpha. So if you're creating automated build and deploy methodologies, which more and more of our enterprise companies are doing, where they want people to check in their results into like a GitHub or into a version control, then a system pulls that down, runs an automated build, and then distributes that app out. You can, we're now making it easier and easier for people to do that so they don't manually have to go into alpha and point and click and run things through. So this is very exciting and it's called the Cordova CLI build and there's going to be uh, more details on it. In fact, uh, I believe there's going to be a lot more details also at our DevCon coming up later this year. And again, this is for helping you automate your development and deployment process to do that there. Performance wise, uh, right now when you drop new files into the web projects control panel, they refresh essentially instantaneously, which is nice. But also this is the big one, which I really like is publishing. A lot of work was done behind the scenes to make publishing your app much, much faster. So now when you want to publish either to Alpha App Server or Alpha App Server in IAS, there's been a lot of optimizations that will allow you to publish that faster. Uh, so therefore you can get your code up on your server that much quicker. And for very large projects, we're seeing significant decrease of time. When you have like tons and tons and tons of different, you know, if it's a pretty large scale app, to publish it could be a little while. Now it works much, much faster. And so check that out. You're gonna find that's gonna save you time and energy as you go through from that standpoint through. A couple other little last things I want to mention, then open it up for questions. First is we have, we've always had, um, and if I can go back into here, um, within our development environment, we could create X basic functions and X basic modules. And then this could hold code and things like that. You'll see, and I'm not running the release on this particular version here, but you'll have a new area here called X basic classes, which is a very powerful way for you to just immediately create a class here without having to create a module and use that class within there. And a class is basically uh, a set of pre-made code that can be used over and over again for whatever you need. And we're excited about that because then it brings in and brings some discipline into creating. So for instance, in my, uh, 
I could create it, but right now a lot of these things are just function libraries that I built up here, and they're in my XBasic module. Uh, there now be classes. And the other thing that's powerful about the class is they're text files. So if you need to check them into Git, you can do that, or a version control. If you need to share that with someone, you can create a set of classes and then just hand them the files. They can drop them in, and boom, they now have those classes available for their application. So that's called XBasic classes. You can also now create node services and node modules right within Alpha. Before, you kind of had to go into the file system, do things there, then go into Alpha, and then set it up within Alpha. Now there's new features that allow you to do that. And that's going to become very, very, I mean, I'm starting to use Node a lot more. And the reason why is Node has a whole bunch of modules that are available out there in the world. And they use a technique called MPM that allows you to dynamically pull that data down. So let's say you were writing a system where you connected to Twitter. Well, there's node modules that are out there that are pre-built that make it easy for you to uh, talk to Twitter. You don't have to do a lot of low-level web API work. Well, now what we can do is use that capability so you can bring down those modules right within Alpha and then start building and using those nod node modules in your code. So if you needed a reason to connect your server to Twitter, let's say when someone updates something, you want to send out a Twitter notice, you could do that very readily. Those are the kind of things we're looking at. And Node's gaining a huge amount of speed in terms of if you look at almost any major system that has a web API, they provide you Node examples that allow you to just copy and paste that. They're like little libraries of code that make it easy for you to call and, and do all the security and all the other things you need to talk to their service. It's really, really fun. Speed typing glossary, now you can create your own speed typing like auto completion within there. And last but not least, uh, Alpha has changed some of the way it handles files and file structuring and file dates and times to facilitate source code. We don't have built-in uh, source control yet. We're working towards that. But we've made a bunch of under-the-cover enhancements so that if you are using source control, we behave much nicer and much easier with source control. Things are in textual data. The dates and times are managed a lot, lot simpler. There's less chaos. And therefore, when you're checking things in and out, uh, they make it life simpler. And there's more details in the release notes you can check out there. Um, but that's the way to go. Uh, oh, Dave has posted everything to everybody, so that's good there. So that's source control. Again, thank you very much. Download that uh, release notes. I'd say if I were to do the one thing, you know, you can, remember you can set up like a separate virtual machine, run some pre-release, things like that. Uh, but uh, very important is that if you do develop off the new dev system, remember your application server has to be in sync. If it's not, it could cause bad things to happen. Like if you created these charts and then published it up in the data series, it wouldn't work there. So always remember, if you're going to go ahead and deploy, you always want to make sure your dev system is in line with your application server system, the versions there. But more importantly is have fun. There's so many cool things in here. The charting stuff alone is worth its weight in gold. I mean, I've already looked at how I'm going to apply it to some projects I'm working on. We have some other projects that are coming up that it's just going to reduce the amount of time and effort to build it. Before you kind of had to, if you were going to use Google charts, you'd have to go through and kind of manually manipulate things, etc. And and it works great and it looks beautiful. But now instead of something that took an hour, it's going to take 10 minutes. And that's a lot of key what they do there. So with that, I'll go all the way up. We got a wide range. As you can see, that's why we called it a new version because we have almost every area was touched uh, with our system and enjoy that from there. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dave and open it up for questions about this and or requests. And again, we're going to be going into these in more detail, especially the charting and some of the other aspects uh, in our next uh, couple webinars. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of things here. Um, first of all, Dan, I'm a little disappointed in the lack of questions. I, some people have asked uh, questions, but I'm only saying there's only like two, three questions. There were there are a lot of people on the line today. I cannot believe we have so few questions. So please go ahead and type them in. Start sending demerits out. We'll get your we'll get to your question today probably if you type it in now. But let's start with the, with a few people who did in fact uh, type it in. Excellent. Um, we appreciate it. First question has to do with charting, and the question is, is this charting meant to replace Google Charts, or it, not? Um, I wouldn't say replace. You are more than welcome to use Google Charts. What this will allow you to do is have an equivalent capability, 
but with a dramatically reduced amount of work to do it, meaning that we've built in the wizards that allow you to build the charts. So with Google Charts, um, there were samples that we included, but you had to kind of go in there and tweak the JavaScript and other pieces now. Now we have the ability to put a chart on a UX control, open up a Genie, tell it what kind of chart, tell it what data series it's connected to, and it does the rest. So the amount of time will be far shorter. So we're not saying don't use Google Chart. By all means, please do. Uh, but try this out because I think what you'll find is that you'll get an equivalent level of visual uh, beauty and visual strikingness uh, and capability. But in this case, it will take you far less to actually build that chart. Uh, now, a couple things like Google Charts now just added Gantt chart capability. It's very rudimentary. But that's something that's not in our charts that I know of. So there may be some things that are specific about Google Charts that you want to use it there. But you could mix and match. There's no reason not. But you'll find as you dive into the new charting capability, the amount of time you'll be able to create a chart will, will dramatically will uh, drop dramatically and, and therefore you can just bang these things out and get them done without having to do a lot of detail coding and, and manipulation. Great. Also, uh, the other thing isn't uh, Google Charts isn't that purely server side so it wouldn't work with disconnected or did I get that wrong? Oh, that's a good point. I, and, and the answer is um, I think you can load the libraries locally but you'd have to do all that yourself. Right. Uh, I think you can actually bring the libraries down, but but uh, that could be an issue. I, I'll, well, let's take an action item to I'll I'll, I'll take, take it to look at that and it come back and let everybody else know. If you could use this over Google Charts, it has a few advantages in that it's very lightweight. You don't need to have an API key, and you could use it offline for sure, definitely. With a new yeah, and, and that that what was really driven by this was two parts. One is that um, we wanted to make it as simple to create charts as you can today with our current charting, which is kind of a little old school looking, and but uses data series, but enabled to do that all offline. And, uh, and to be honest, these new charts are much better looking than our existing core charting engine. Uh, but what's great is that if you've ever done core charting with our data series, and you're going to find that the process is identical. Now, one thing that is cool that I, I, when I was doing a preview with the development team, you can use data series but you can also do a lot, of, once you kind of get used to it, you can do some really fun stuff with it. You can make your charts super dynamic based upon information that's on the mobile device. And it's not hard. You're basically just doing kind of a copy-paste kind of scenario. So again, uh, I, I, the key driver was offline, beautiful charts, easy to use, easy to set up. And you will find much simpler to Google uh, Maps. And I think we'll just see this dominate because it's going to be so much easier to do. Uh, you know, you're, you're done. You just go up, open up, add it to it. And, I, and we're going to be doing, I, I really think our next session should be going through a little bit more detail and showing you about that since it's so cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, right. So someone asked if they could see a demo, but I think we'll need to wait till next time. But there are videos available yes. right away. Um, so if you take a look at that link, you should be able to find them. Yeah, someone has done a series of his fabulous videos to show you examples of how we can do it, uh, and uh, and feel free to check those out. You're really gonna you're gonna be blown away when you see how easy it is to do these beautiful charts. Terrific. All right, going through the questions here, looks like a few more have come in. All right, I have a tough one. I'm guessing, Dean, as smart as you are, you're probably not gonna be able to answer this one. Maybe <laughs> shot. Uh, very high chance. I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to blow your confidence. I'm sure you can handle this one. Wah, the, wah, the, IIS, the IIS adapter was made to increase uh, web application server's performance. What, what are the main things that eat server resources? Is it ah, variables, it. summary fields, sessions, all the above? Um, the, I would say the number one impact that we see is on server loading is first and foremost is the number of connections that are currently being managed. So at a certain point, there's just so many connections and the server is doing its best to respond to each one of them. And as those grows, it's doing you know, basically a, a queuing system where it's responding to them and you'll start seeing slowdown from that standpoint there. Uh, now, there are techniques available with alpha on the standalone app server where you can actually, using always up, you can actually assign a server to each core and then kind of distribute the load. And that's a very simplistic methodology that's available for even the standalone one, given the licensing of so many cores for your license there. 
what IIS buys us is that IIS handles all of that for you and uses all the cores right out of the gate. So it's much more efficient in terms of its ability to use the available resources. And so really what happens is a quick, you know, if you look at the basics, and we're going to be doing a whole web uh, services concept, a browser sends a request to the server, the server queues that up and then addresses that request. And therefore it uses, um, uh, it will then, you know, say, okay, great. Uh, you know, you're fifth in line. I've got these other four people who already came in that I got a service and send the result back. And so first, if you can distribute that load among multiple cores, each of the cores is servicing that and then it gets queued up back out there. With IIS, it handles all that automatically for you and so it gives much better performance because it's managed, has a whole layer to do that there. So connections, active live connections. It's not like you might have 500 people using your website but 400 of them have it just sitting there doing nothing and only at you know, a certain amount. It's those uh, sort of uh, uh, concurrent connections, which is your first step there. Now, that said, we highly recommend that you know, the more cores you have, the better, because then you can distribute the load across cores. Therefore, the cores are going to be faster. Um, secondly, also is memory. Because when the server is processing something, it's, it's taking memory to build up, say, an image of a web page in HTML before it sends that information back down or it's putting together those pieces there. The other area you want to look at definitely is that if you're using sort of static graphics and stuff like that, you can use content to distribution networks that handle a lot of that kind of stuff, which is kind of nice. So therefore, you only kind of traffic you have going back is your core application traffic. But first step is, you know, make sure your server is set up to maximize the use of the available server resources. Make sure you definitely have memory available, you know, three, four gigs. And then if you got a lot more, more than that, because then the processor is not swapping things around. It's, it's getting that. I found really important too, just to let you know, is that if you're on a server, make sure it's an SSD server. Just moving from a uh, plain vanilla server to an SSD oriented server, we have found just immediate improvements in speed. Uh, because if it does have to hit the disk for images, uh, data, etc., it, it's just so much faster getting it from an SSD back to the app server to the app server delivering it to the end person than waiting for a hard drive to spin around to be available there. Uh, so we find that you know SSD hosting is very is a very high benefit in terms of increasing speed with and it takes no configuration. It just works because it's just handling it from there. And the nice thing is SSD servers have become much, much cheaper. And in fact most hosting companies are standardizing on that because it just your apps run like very, very quickly. Uh, and it, and for them, they you know the newer it's getting cheaper to put SSD. So make sure you're using the number of cores you can use on your server. Secondly, make sure you have plenty of memory for all those cores so that it can grab the memory when it needs it. Third, if you're on a hard drive setup, immediately look at seeing going to SSD. You'll go there. And then last but not least is that if you're kind of getting to the end on a standalone I, uh, alpha app server, uh, you can look at IIS as a micro migration strategy to allow you to, to take advantage of all the IS because IS also does some nice little caching and other techniques to just reduce the latency for all these recourse, requests that are coming in from people out in the field. Terrific. Um, here's a question. Can the Flying Start Wizard, Flying Start Genie, can it use any input other than access? Can it do MySQL, SQL Server, Postgres? I don't know. <laughs> let me check real quick. Okay. Let's open it up. Yeah. Let's go to the let's go to the page. Yeah, let's go to the boards. Uh, okay. Let's go to the genie. I think it's on control panel here. I haven't used it in a while. I, I I've been meaning to get through and checking out the latest version tool. I've got the work size up size genie, but I think that's different. The work size is I've got an existing DBF solution I want to do on there. Um, but even better, everybody should know. Go to help. Open documentation. Yep. Why don't we hand that over to Sarah? She actually knows where that's at, where that's Excellent. buried. Yeah. It takes a village. Well, in my case, it takes a village idiot, but for our team, it's a village. <laughs> I'm the idiot, so we need that help for me. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to Sarah. All right, Sarah, I've unmuted you. Could you help us find the documentation on the new um, uh, Flying Star Genie so we can check it out? Yes. Um, it's right there at the top. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 
<laughs> this is actually, uh, we didn't have any until last week, so this is all new. Um, this is all new. Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah. So the question was whether the Flying Start Genie could work with other database backends. Besides and Access, yeah. Besides Access, yes. The Flying Start Genie actually uses a Alpha DAO connection string. Ah, and so for anything you can build a connection right. string to, you can, you can use this uh, Flying Start Genie. And in fact, it actually requires a named connection as part of the setup. Oh, so, gotcha. Wow. Yeah. So you, could, you could use JSON data. You could use a web service API. You could use anything we could do in an Alpha DAO connection string, too. I believe so. Yeah. I it, it gets a little fuzzy on those ones. I'm not okay. sure uh, if it will actually handle that. Uh, uh, I haven't tested it myself. They haven't tested that. But it, it my SQL, SQL at, Server, Postgres, DB2, sort yeah, of the yeah. SQL Any Server Yeah, yeah. Any SQL database. Yeah. Great. Good. Mm -hmm. Excellent answer. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. And just to show everybody, you can see uh, what it does is it looks at the foreign key relationships. So, for instance, you'll see in here we have customers, orders, and uh, order items. And since it knows those relationships, it automatically pre-builds these connected uh, grids. So these are three connected grids automatically. So it creates every top-level table, and then if there's uh, second-level foreign keys, it does all that for you. It's currently just saves you time having to do that for yourself. So and that's really cool. You can use it at anything other. Um, most people use it with access. Uh, I've just seen because they're upsizing into uh, the new generation, but now that's really slick and, and nice able to do. And, nice. and I've had a lot of questions recently, and there's someone associated with that, is also if you have a traditional, um, a traditional DBF system, we have some really cool tools in here, and I've actually had two different projects talk about this recently, but what you can do is you can um, create an operation, and you can take DBF, and you can import the records, and when you import it, you can import it into, let's see, into, I'm sorry, let's see, I'm sorry, I go to, uh, I can take, create this operation, it's going to be actually an export, and what I can do is actually export it to a SQL database. So I can take DBF files and it works beautifully. Um, it moves it into a database. Now, once it's in that database, you probably need to do like unique IDs and some other cleanup work. But you can preserve all of your data because it imports the structure and also the values that are in there and all the existing records. Uh, so that's a cool feature for if you're moving from DBF, which people, there's still systems out there that are DBF oriented and they're ready to move up into like a more modern environment. They want to move the database and also the user interface. Uh, these are tools they can do along with the Flying Star Genie. Uh, so very cool stuff from there. So, Excellent. Um... Here's a great question. Could you capture a latitude, longitude, date, and time when a button is clicked in a UX? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, let me go ahead and go here. I'll go to my controls. I'll go ahead and add a new button here. So folks that are new, this is our alpha development environment. I'm on what's called a UX component, which is our form. Over here are my different types of controls. As you can see, we have a wide range of them here. Uh, my actually controls are laid out here and this is the data. So I've added a button here and I'm going to go ahead and double click on that button and I could go ahead and type in here JavaScript but what we can also do is use what's called Action JavaScript and what Action JavaScript is is a whole bunch of pre-made actions things like uh, mapping components so we'll have like the graphing components and other things like there but we also have built into it um, some geolocation functions. We also have geocoding. So if you have an address, you can ge geocode it. But we have geolocation functions. And what we can do is we can get the data, uh, set the fields, and so we can go in here, grab the information uh, from the hardware, and then uh, you know put in a timestamp, the speed, latitude and longitude, heading, etc. So if I clicked on this button, I could tell it, any of these, I can map them to fields on my user interface. So you can say, like, click a button and it would immediately record, it would call the hardware, find this information out, and then map them into controls on my user interface. And then I would have all this, including the accuracy, uh, altitude, heading, etc., that's available. And obviously that's dependent upon the hardware that's available. Um, but even if I'm in a web browser, I could do that, and it's going to give me the latitude and longitude. It's going to ask the person to approve you're grabbing that data. But on a mobile platform, like a phone out in the field, you can grab all this stuff and save that into fields. 
And if that's like a list detail view, the detail view then can be saved to the list, and then the list can update the back-end database with the information that you collected. And the cool thing is that's all done through Action JavaScript, so there's no coding, no JavaScript that you actually have to write to make this work. You just put the fields on your interface, click, put the button there, tell it to do this, map those fields that you want to fill out, and it does the rest for you. Excellent. Terrific. Uh, we have a documentation question. Um, are there any plans to release to create release notes that are available on their own. For example, release notes that are separate for 4.4 than simply having a huge HTML file of all the updates since 2013. Oh, that's for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, are, There's no active plans to do that. I do like the idea of doing, um, being able to get that information in a very uh, a nice way, but uh, something that we've we've been thinking about is actually just um, pulling that from the documentation itself and tagging everything that was released with those release notes, because because the release notes don't actually document everything uh, that gets added. It doesn't document the vast um, set of new properties in detail or oh, yeah. or provide like um, uh, information about uh, updates to to functions that might have existed for a while. Um, so the idea would be if we tagged new content with mm -hmm. uh, update versions, then you could conceivably do a search in the documentation system and say, show me just stuff from 4.4. Yeah, and grab so everything that. from that release. You may notice right now we are actively tagging uh, new content with the build it was released in. So you may have seen this is a pre-release feature across the top of a page, and that's right. that's queued off of off of the build information, so that we are we are trying to get that in there. We do have a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to update. So excellent, that's that a great question. Uh, someone asked about integration to WordPress. I believe you covered that once, did we not? Recently? Yeah, we actually have a whole webinar on that. That's yeah. available in the um, actually it was a canned one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. That's available there. Great. Um, Here's a question about data series. Can data series be based on uh, list control offline? Uh, yes, and the reason why is, uh, and that's a great question, um, when I go ahead and put in a, a data series, I can actually specify JavaScript, and then, then you can grab the data from the list control and do that there. So uh, let me see if it actually shows on this one here. I don't think it shows here. Uh, notice there's some commands to do things like resize redraw, et cetera. No, not details there. But absolutely, you can build it uh, off of the list data. So you can take that list data and have it update the chart with whatever's in the list. So if you're adding new records, et cetera, you can refresh that chart by grabbing the data from that list data and putting in there. Someone wrote in that they had an issue with a video control component and that they couldn't use it to display videos in their, in their database. Um, so and they and they use some other method, but uh, we would be interested in seeing what you were doing. If you could send an email to guides g u i d e s at alphasoftware.com, we just want to make sure that the video component is up and running. I've yes, some complaints recently, but I I'm not the person who typically gets them, and uh, I do know who is in charge of that program, and we could take a look because we do want to make sure that's up to date. Videos are. We will have time. them fired. We. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> oh wait, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> No, we'll just we'll, it will just be a demerit with some you know pay reduction, and we'll get it fixed. It'll all be done. So, <laughs> but no, let us know. We want to know. Great. Um, let me see what else is going on. Some people have written out about the audio quality of some of these of these webinars while they're listening in. Usually not the recordings are usually fine. And just a just a quick note: if that does happen to you, you find it like clipping out, and it's and it's no good, or you, the sound drops altogether. Often just dropping out of GoToWebinar and reconnecting is all it takes to get the sound back. It's some. The other option to too is dial in on your phone. Ah, uh, you can dial um, in on your phone by clicking the phone. That's a big one. Button. And yeah. then you just put your phone on speaker next to it. I find that the phone is uh, just it's a phone. It's more reliable. It's been around forever, and uh, you don't get some some about audio through the web. You can start getting those dropouts, but definitely like when I do my Go To uh, meetings, if someone's having a hard time, I say, Hey, hang up mute your system, call back on the number, and then we're, we're golden at that point. Cool. So I don't have a lot to talk about on this right now, but someone did ask about the new Alpha certification courses that were announced cool. yesterday. 
And I don't know, Dean, if you want to take a crack at that or like no, we're very excited. I mean, one of the key things is that we're seeing a huge amount of activity around Alpha, and Alpha continues to gain enormous amount of momentum in the marketplace um, within larger enterprises, mainly because of our unique capabilities with offline disconnected mobile apps, uh, the continued improvement in capabilities like these things you're seeing here with charting and stuff. It's just making life simpler. But we're also finding that there's an uh, increased demand for people who are competent to be able to build these apps and uh, you know and so what we want to do is offer the ability for developers to go through courses and become certified that allow them to signify to the world that they have a certain level of proficiency uh, and therefore also for enterprises we can offer to them saying listen we've created this certification program we can really guide you to the people who know what they're doing and have gone through this training so that you can feel confident when you engage with them that they're going to be able to produce the results you're looking for. So we're very excited about that. We're going to have some great courses that are built around this certification and the different aspects of it. As you can see, Alpha is a very broad platform. You have not only mobile, but web, but even mobile, you have phone gap, you have all these elements. But we're going to be providing uh, a really nice set so people you know, can focus on the areas uh, that they are interested in, but also get certified to show they have different skill sets for doing things with Alpha. Uh, that's great. Um, and the first one is coming up at the end of, towards the end of April. Uh, uh -huh. It has to do with web services. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Alpha has a, a lot of um, pre-built capabilities to use web services. And so we're going to be using that certification series or certification to go through and explain a little bit of background about certif of what services are. But more importantly is how do you use the tools built into Alpha to engage and use those services. And uh, it, it's really going to be a fun course. We're doing a lot of uh, research on it to make sure we provide you all the key data and we're taking into account what kind of problems we're seeing uh, companies we're talking to uh, mm -hmm. how they're using services and how people want to use those services. Oh, that's good. Um, just another question, uh, is Facebook login available with the IIS application server? I'm not sure. I believe all, yeah, I believe all security capabilities are available for both IIS and standalone. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to send that question over to guides at alphasoftware.com. I will find out for sure from the person who is in charge of that and let you know. Um, let's see what else we've got here. There is a request for doing an upcoming webinar in which uh, we show off how to use Node with Alpha Anywhere. Ah, Maybe how to do a, a mock integration of an API using Node. <laughs> We're actually going to touch on that in the okay. uh, the certification, uh, the okay. web services. We're but we're not going to do a real, you know, we're going to touch on it because there's about four different ways to do stuff, and I want to make sure everybody has that broad right. base of understanding. Uh, but definitely, that's a great thing because we're just seeing Node is becoming, it's just it's awesome. You just all these libraries available. Great. Uh, someone's asking for a link for Alpha certification. I don't have a link right now. Uh, what you can read about, you'll actually find in the software, in the news, news and updates screen of Alpha Anywhere, we'll tell you about certification and the email that you can contact to see uh, if, you, if uh, you are eligible to take the course. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Someone else is pointing out that it would be good if we were a little bit more detailed in our descriptions about our webinars so we can find what you're looking for when you go to videos.alphasoftware.com. We completely agree with that. We're, we're going to try to catch up on that. Um, I think that is, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone's question here, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, raise it, your I'm hand. I'm looking if through 59. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any pre-field functions for using NFC slash RFID? I believe that's near field communication and uh, right. RFID tags. And convert Not, I don't know of any action JavaScript. That's going to be more of a PhoneGap plugin capability. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are definitely PhoneGap plugins that are available. Actually, let me see if I have something here. PhoneGap. Let me go ahead in here. What is it going to do? Okay. Um, let's say NFC. Yeah. Okay. So that we have an NFC plugin already designated. Mm -hmm. um, it read and writes in-depth messages to tags or shares that with their peers. 
So it's kind of the, the plugin is listed at the bottom if you need to get documentation on yeah, it. Yeah, you can actually see yep. and it's in the registry npm. There you go. Exactly. So it has all the on FFC. And then the other one was um, there was another um, RFID. RFID. I'm not sure if there's any RFID stuff that's built in. None that we've encountered so far. Yeah, Very cool. cool. I mean, though. that's I'm gonna write that down because that's I'm yeah, sure because you know, factories and inventory management, RFID is huge in that side. So, and there has to be RFID plugins out there, you know, from that standpoint. Excellent. Great. Well, we have reached the end of the hour. Uh, Dion, thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. And thanks to all of you in the audience for logging in today, taking an hour out of your time, and for asking questions. We hope to see you at a future webinar, and we should have this webinar posted within the next day or two to videos.alphasoftware.com. So until next time, thank you very much, and goodbye.